in one way um, or another. Any questions, Jay? Everybody's asking. Yes. Does, it, does hypnosis actually work? Geez, I hope so. Uh, otherwise, I've been wasting 40 years of my career. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, hypnosis actually does work. But, th but there, are some prov there are some provisos here. Let me answer the question a couple of different ways. Um, first, hypnosis works, but it doesn't work for everybody. Okay? Um, you've got to be highly hypnotizable to experience the kinds of things that you saw, for example, in those videos. And I apologize for the quality of those videos, but they are so good. Um, uh, and uh, if we could get better videos, be better copies of those, we could. Uh, we just can't. Um, so you got to be highly hypnotizable. So there we're talking about 5%, 10% of the population can do the kinds of things that you saw, can feel like they're glued to a chair and be unable to get up. Uh, or uh, eat, a, eat a lemon as if it were a peach, uh, or whatever it is you, 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 you saw those individuals uh, do. Yeah, you see those. I've seen them. Um, now, there are less dramatic phenomena of hypnosis that are more accessible to people. So uh, you saw in the, one of those videos the Canadian woman who couldn't get up from her chair, for example, or couldn't hold the pack of cigarettes. Um, but uh, even people who are only moderately hypnotizable can experience something like that where we might suggest to somebody that their outstretched arm is tightly outstretched like an iron bar, so thick, so stiff you can't bend it. Now try to bend it, and they seem not to be able to bend it. So it, you, know, uh, you don't have to be highly hypnotizable to have that experience, but you know, the more hypnotizable you are, the more it's going to work. Um, we also know, uh, for example, in uh, the pain clinic, that hypnotic suggestions for pain relief are, can be very effective, and not just for the 5 or 10% of people who are deemed highly hypnotizable, you know, hypnotic virtuosos, uh, but for maybe as many as half of an unselected population of pain clinic uh, patients can get significant pain relief. Uh, by, by, by virtue of hypnosis. Um, uh, by what, what do you mean by significant? Well, rated pain diminished by one-third. Okay, so now imagine, for example, the, the most severe pain that you, you yourself have ever felt in the dentist chair or on the football field or whatever, and now imagine that being reduced by one-third. Now, pretty, I'll take it. Um, uh, so... Uh, it, it, it definitely works in that respect. I think the most dramatic exam, the, the most dramatic demonstration, uh, is that research I showed you a little bit of uh, in, uh, in in lecture by Elvira Lang, who's a professor at uh, the Harvard Medical School, uh, who routinely uses hypnosis as an adjunct, um, uh, or what in, in medicine they call adjuvant therapy, uh, for uh, various kinds of outpatient. Uh, surgical procedures. And there she finds that the use of hypnosis reduces the need for medication, reduces patient request for medication, reduces complications, reduces the cost of surgery, not least because it's reducing requests for medications and reducing consequences. Uh, even when you add in the cost of the hypnotist, it's still cost effective. Uh, so in, uh, and this is something we knew going back to the middle part of the 19th century, I showed you that quote early on from James Esdale where he talks about how, oh, maybe my patients are just faking that they're getting pain relief, uh, but they're sending their friends and relatives to him for surgery. Um, uh, so it, 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 in that respect, it does work. Um, how it works exactly, uh, we don't have a very clear idea about that. We're beginning to trace some of the changes um, in, uh, in the brain that occur when some of these effects transpire. 
Uh, we know, for example, that uh, hypnotic suggestions for, um, for analgesia, for, for pain relief, affect patterns of activation in two particular areas of the cortex. One, the um, uh, somatosensory area in the parietal lobe, and the other is what you might call the suffering area uh, associated with the anterior cingulate cortex. And um, a Canadian uh, uh, neuroscientist named Pierre Rainville has done very nice studies tracing uh, the effects of, uh, of suggestion on both the somatosensory area and the, uh, and the anterior cingulate. So we know pr as a practical matter, matter that it works, and we're be beginning to be able to see some of the associated changes in the brain that it works, uh, about why it works. Um, there are not that many brain imaging studies of hypnosis uh, yet, in part because brain imaging is still pretty expensive, but also because the brain imaging technique of choice right now is uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. That's what everybody wants to do. Um, and fMRI is just really noisy. <laughs> Uh, the magnet is a very noisy place to be, and it's hard to stay hypnotized. You can do it. Uh, it's hard to stay hypnotized in such an environment. Imagine uh, trying to concentrate on something with, you know, little kids running around making noise. It's kind of like that's that's the, that's the racket that it's like. So there are practical things that kind of get in the way. Uh, but for those of you who are going off to uh, to medical school someday, if you get offered a course in hypnosis, take it. Uh, gee, it's, it's but, but, huh? Yeah, there are. Uh, there are two highly regarded, um, uh, oh, this is advertisement, but I'll do it quickly. There are two highly regarded uh, professional so societies, the Society for Clinical and Experimental Hypnosis, SCEH, and the American Society for Clinical Hypnosis, ASCH. And one or the other of those um, basically is the, is the go-to professional society for all qualified professionals who use hypnosis in their practice. Physicians, clinical psychologists, dentists, nurse practitioners, psychiatric social workers, um, all, the, all, all, the, all those individuals. There are other societies around, uh, but they do not have the professional cachet uh, that SEH and ASCH do. Both of those, um, both of those uh, groups offer workshops on an annual or sometimes more than annual basis where physicians or medical students or whatever can get, uh, can get training. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, you can pick this kind of thing up in graduate school um, as, uh, as well. So there's training around. Uh, and uh, look for that membership certificate on the wall. The hypnotist union, Ah, not so much. Um, uh, there are all sorts of uh, organizations with the word hypnosis in their name, but the two you should be looking for are the ones I just mentioned. Um, but the, the, the other important thing is, I think this is the most important single rule about clinical hypnosis, is that nobody should try to treat something with hypnosis who's not qualified to treat it without hypnosis. All right? Um, so if you've got some medical problem, you shouldn't be going to your barber um, for, uh, for uh, the treatment uh, for that, uh, or uh, for that matter, to a clinical psychologist, uh, except with a referral, okay, uh, which, the, which, you, which you can sometimes get. Uh, but the general rule is hypnosis should be a choice, not the only thing the, you, that, that your clinician can do. And there are, go, just go to the yellow pages. After exam week, you know, when you're not reading Julie and Jane, uh, pick up the telephone directory if you still have one. Um, look under H in the yellow pages, and you'll see page after page of hypnotists. And almost none of them are qualified to do what they are doing. Oh, enough of that. Um, okay. Then finally, the origins of consciousness, uh, development of consciousness viewed ontogenetically in the lifespan of the individual, phylogenetically in terms of the evolution of species, or culturally in terms of um, uh, 
basically historical, uh, historical time. Uh, we can think about consciousness from each of those, um, each of those perspectives. Anything there? Everybody got your copy of Julian James to read over break? I sometimes think I should just assign that as fun reading, but to be honest, I think Lodge is more fun. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, when you look at the writings of yogis and Zen masters and their Western interpreters uh, about what meditation is supposed to do for you, the one theme that keeps cropping up is somehow meditation is supposed to free yourself from habitual modes of thought to allow you to experience the world uh, in, a, uh, in a new way. Arthur Dykeman actually was a guy who, who coined this term de-automatization as a kind of summary uh, for, uh, for all of this. And uh, when he did that in the 1960s, we had only a kind of rough and ready concept of what we meant by automatization. But if you, talk, if you ever talk to somebody who's like a practicing Zen Buddhist or a practicing yoga, y y yogi or whatever, they'll talk to you about how you know, most people just kind of um, move through the world kind of on automatic pilot, not, too, not uh, basing their behaviors on habits and not thinking too much about what's going on and really not getting it, um, uh, to use a, uh, a kind of California 60s uh, 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 term. Um, and so meditation is supposed to change the way you think about the world. It's supposed to change the way you experience uh, the world and kind of break up these automatized habitual patterns of thought that keep you in this, these mental prison cells that we're all supposed to, uh, supposed to be in. Well, okay, fine. Well, how would you know? Okay, how would you know that you actually uh, experienced the automatization? Well, the, um, the, different, the, the different religious traditions have, quest have, have, have answers for this. For example, in some uh, Hindu uh, yoga traditions, uh, the achievement of enlightenment is supposed to be uh, manifested by your ability to uh, uh, withstand uh, tremendous physical challenges, sleeping on a bed of nails or uh, hanging upside down from a rope and all this kind of stuff that yogis used to do, which they don't do that much anymore, interestingly. Uh, or in, uh, in uh, Zen, you're supposed to achieve Satori and you have enlightenment, you understand what the sound of one hand clapping is and, uh, and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, that's all fine, you know, uh, but beginning in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, when this concept of automaticity and this distinction between controlled and automatic processing uh, took hold, uh, we began to uh, realize that we actually had a set of laboratory measures that we could use to actually test whether meditation was having the kinds of effects on the mind uh, that, it's, uh, that it's supposed to be having. So um, just to take one little example, there was that, uh, that uh, case study by Paul Ekman and um, Bob Levinson uh, here at, uh, at uh, UC uh, on startle response in Tibetan monks. So startle response.